this is a new topic, but not a new process. We've been fighting this fight since Columbus. Uh, ways of making our world mesh with the, the, great, uh, the, the larger world around us. I almost said greater and would have slapped myself for that. But um, so as Jeff could tell you, as Rebecca could tell you, and as Abigail could tell you, when they were going through their post-secondary degrees and were the only brown faces in those rooms, or at least native faces in those rooms, they are our own vaccines in their respective fields. We, we didn't have native lawyers, we didn't have native MDs, and we didn't have native uh, advanced degree holders in our fields, and we do now, and they are inoculating us from some of the terrible things that happened to us pre -consent, in the pre-consent days. And so I think this that's one of the ways we need to couch this argument is that this isn't a new thing, it's just a new way of looking at it and a new topic within that thing. Um, this is the same thing that we've dealt with when it comes to land issues and sovereignty issues with respect to tribal legal status. It's the same thing we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with our under-equipped and underfunded Indian health services. Um, so I, it's, it's not new. None of these things are almost hardly ever new uh, except for the topic that we're talking about. I can't even tell you how impressive you guys are. Like I so much appreciate everything that has just been said. And I don't think I was, even making the link between our responsibilities individually and then in the community sense around that whole idea of sovereignty and how we exercise it. So it was really meaningful to me, like when I met Rose and I heard about how that whole concept, which I still can't pronounce, I'm so sorry, Rosa, pharmacogenomics, <laughs> like whatever that was, <laughs> that was like, what? You know, that that idea of like a different genome and then the interactions with drugs, I, I never thought about that until I was with your group. And then I see that today, like just how, how you would transmit that virus. It might be environmental, but then there could be genetic components. And certainly with respect to the treatment or vaccine, like that interaction between environment and genome seems like it's it's pretty established now. But I feel like the communities don't necessarily always see that. So one of the things that I'm thinking about right now as you guys are talking is A, how do you make that, the advances in genomic medicine that have helped Native people and what this project really is about is protecting tribal sovereignty and tribal health as part of that. And then how that maps on to either the individual responsibility, which is informed consent, but made meaningful for native individuals and communities, which I think is that missing step right now. And then on the end of data sovereignty. So this is another question for you guys who are the health experts. When I think of data sovereignty, I think of tribal governments knowing what is being collected about their members how that is gonna be used either in the issue at hand, which could be the vaccine trial or whatever, but also in the larger issue about like drug interactions, pharmacogenomics or whatever that was, like it, how is that data gonna be transmitted back to the tribal government? So, so is there a way to break that out of these studies so that not only do the researchers like Moderna see, oh, our vaccine is totally effective with you know, Caucasian people, but it has these problems with other people. Like, how is that gonna be related back to them? And then that whole idea of secondary consent and uses, like, is that gonna be a collaborative process? And like, d it, does NIH have like a role in the whole like rollout of this with respect to native communities? Or is it like diverse communities in America? Are they all citizens, Black, Hispanic, Native? And so they're all treated like equally in terms of the public health mission, but that's like an equity thing for race. I'm just not sure what that looks like in terms of the build out, but it seems like fundamental before I could even talk about how data sovereignty ought to work. Like I would have to know that system. My dear friend, Ronnie Whitener, another attorney, maybe you know him, he worked on things like that with me. And, and there are a lot of tribes who do that. 
um, and have that within their tribal IRBs. And for tribes who don't have tribal IRBs, they have it within their tribal resolutions. And that also goes to um, biospecimens. So when there are biospecimens that are gathered, blood samples, tissue samples, whatever it is, there has to be very strong protections in place and we can do that. That is part of that indigenous data sovereignty. The data is the biospecimen, the data is the survey, the data is every interaction with the individuals and the tribes. And those protections have to be built in to ensure that we don't see um, misuse of this information. And then it builds the beauty of our communities by participating in the science and that the science ends up having relevance to our communities. I think that this also needs to be part of the education process of uh, uh, community members in, especially in urbanized settings when um, they're going to someplace like Harborview and they're sitting down and they're being told about the study. They, needed, they need to know that they need to ask, well, what are you going to do with my information? Are you going to use this in other studies? Do you have to get my permission to do that? You know, it, uh, it's really a big ask, but it really is so important to the ultimate goal of getting uh, natives into uh, research studies. Yeah, I agree, Bill. I 100% this, this um, pandemic world that we're living in right now has really shown a spotlight on these questions that we're raising today that have been asked for many years, it's just now it's such an urgent time um, that you feel like you have to cram for everything <laughs> that we're talking about to learn it. Um, but people are listening right now and we should be um, getting this information out to them in any way possible because they will be sitting in the waiting room at Harborview or wherever the trials are open um, and they're, they're asking people if they want to participate. And not many people recognize the value of, the, of their information and their samples, blood samples, DNA. In this world we're living in right now, there are biobanks that are commercially operated. Um, many people that are signing a bunch of things sitting in the waiting room worrying about having to have a biopsy are not reading the fine print. So how do we get that information in digestible forms out to people like our, our aunties and uncles? Well, I had an experience uh, at a urology appointment in Bismarck, North Dakota. I went up there uh, just for a quick doctor's visit. There was not gonna be any samples given or anything. But they put in my packet of information, they gave me about a 20 page document and said, here, sign this. And so I went back to fill out my other stuff and I was reading through it and it was the broadest consent form I'd ever seen. And so I went up and asked the gal questions at the desk and she goes, I, yeah, I don't know what it is. You're just supposed to sign it. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to sign it, but I'll gladly talk about it with the doctor. And I don't think that the person sitting behind the desk, the clerk there is part of some grand conspiracy trying to extract samples from my native body and exploit me. I think she's just a, an unwitting pawn in, in the overall monster that kind of does these things. And, and that was just a, a direct anecdote. I'm sorry, a little off topic to what Rose is saying, but the point I wanted to make was the way that I like to look at this stuff is I don't think there's any such thing as data sovereignty. I don't think there's any such thing as food sovereignty. I think there's sovereignty. Mm. And then there happens to be data and food underneath them. And we have to quit talking about protecting sovereignty and start strengthening it. Strengthening it. Um, sovereignty isn't a shield to keep us safe in the middle of the night when we're scared. It's a suite of weapons, including a shield. And it's meant for us to gain ground. And we're responsible for gaining ground on behalf of our participants, on behalf of our relatives, like 
like Jeff and uh, Abigail like to say, and the tribes are the ones that are responsible for that. So they are responsible for making themselves be more sophisticated. And, and we have an RRB set up statutorily in our, at Cheyenne River, but they haven't done the work to stand it up and have it be a functioning entity of the tribe. So now every research project that happens has to go before the tribal health committee and then the full council, or when they're not available, it needs to be done by executive order through the, the administration. And until the tribes get up to speed on these things and build in those, uh, those topical infrastructures so that these mechanisms can be done in a, in a regulated ethical way, not just an ethical way because the people are good, but in a way that kind of can kind of regulate the ethics, we're gonna be stuck in this scenario where our people are gonna be mistrustful of the, of the outsiders that are coming, oftentimes wanting to help. 